So that was pretty much uh, a technocratic uh, version of an afterlife, I guess. Um, here are some of the people that I photographed as well. Which makes me come to the final uh, case study of the project, which is about uh, the Life Extension Institute in uh, Palm Springs, California. Um, there is this institute uh, where they uh, experimenting with uh, the telomerase enzyme. And uh, this is uh, an enzyme that stops your uh, telomeres from uh, getting shorter, which actually means that you more or less can create uh, an immortal cell. And um, this is the doctor who is actually experimenting with this. But the, uh, the interesting thing here is, I think, uh, it's in Palm Springs, which is a place with mainly very fortunate people. So here you could almost say that if their techniques work, it's only for the bourgeoisie and not for the proletariat, which is kind of a strange connection, I think. Here's one of the late. And this makes me come to my uh, next project, which is called uh, Rhinoceros. Um, well, the idea of this project can be uh, seen as it's 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 titled after the painting by uh, Durer, uh, Rhinoceros, that you see right here. Um, he's a 16th century painter who was very famous for his uh, representations of uh, flora and fauna during that time. And he got the commission to paint a rhino in the 16th century, but uh, there weren't any rhinos in uh, Western Europe during that time. So he based his sketch on uh, some uh, sketches of an unknown artist. And this was the result, which isn't a very accurate uh, representation of a rhino, but it got part of the collective memory in the century, centuries after that. And you can see that in the arts, but also in some scientific publications. For example, here you see him in between the dodo. <laughs> and for example here. And this, this is exactly the concept that I've been working on. Like, how do we depict events that we haven't witnessed? And how do they color and change our collective memory in a way? And um, I interviewed several people with the question, can you describe uh, the landscape of uh, the Earth before humanity arrived? And the other question was, can you describe an artifact from the near future? And well, the utopic future thinking of my last project, uh, well, this is something completely different. To most people who I asked about uh, the past refer to the cliche of uh, a rainforest and uh, uh, when I ask them about the future, they mainly refer to yeah, a very dystopic society with almost non-human objects. And I also have a, a short sound piece here which describes that. <laughs>
I think that this kind of arc of technology is such that people want to distinguish them from their bodies. This is a separate object from me. But they become closer and closer linked to our bodies. I imagine that in terms of objects, what's going to happen is that these things which bind us together through technology like Facebook or Apple Watches or whatever will become... I suspect that there would be people who would want those objects to become less visible and more body-like. And so I imagine finding an artifact from the future which looks like, um, you know, uh, as not a sock or a watch, but, you know, it looks like it's a section of a body, you know, but it's meant to be worn and, you know, it's, it's some ethnicity's skin color, um, you know, and when you were to put this thing on your wrist, your ears, your, your chest, your leg, etc., you know, that it would um, almost become invisible. Um, and so that its point wasn't to distinguish itself from your body or to adorn your body, but its point was to, you know, become unseen, I guess. Um, and I would probably want to puke all over it. I don't know. I mean, the older that I get and the more reliant that I become on technology, the more deeply that I loathe it. You know, I really miss writing letters and I really miss sitting on the train without my phone. There's nothing less appealing than a world where, you know, I can't touch and feel and smell and be with the moment or the person or the body. Body, object is body, body is object, whatever. And uh, as a reaction on these uh, interviews I did, um, I uh, uh, researched uh, several case studies, and I'm going to present you uh, one of them. Um, I, I had a peek into a 19th century book that uh, has engravings in it that uh, depict the earth uh, before humanity. And uh, what I found uh, really interesting in uh, these depictions is that uh, they pretty much uh, refer to, to uh, the biblical depictions that we know. For me, this image more or less refers to uh, a deluge or something like that, while it pre uh, pretends to be a, a scientific look to, uh, to the landscape before humanity. Um, what I did is I made uh, reactions uh, on these depictions. And uh, they are all on uh, an island where there is still uh, flora of uh, the moment before humanity uh, arrived. And this is because uh, the Ice Age didn't really has uh, uh, much impact there. And for me it was really interesting to, to play with this idea where, well, when you work with photography you only can work from the present, of course. And for me, it was interesting in the age of, for example, the Anthropocene debate, where, like you mentioned, uh, nothing is nature, everything is culture in a way, um, to, to play with this idea and photograph a place which refers to a complete other age and to a complete other concept and idea. Um, I don't know how much time I have left, because I don't know. Can anybody tell me that? Okay. And uh, in another case study, um, I had a peek into um, well, the idea of uh, an aurok. Uh, the aurok got extinct in uh, the 16th century. And there's a Dutch organization who, who tried to bring back the, the original form of this animal. But it got uh, domesticated ten, uh, thousands of years ago. So there isn't really a reference of how they would have looked like. But um, I combined, well, this sketchings with material 
with um, uh, one of the replicas of the Lasco uh, cave, where there are depictions of this same animal, um, but also in different versions. So there's sort of a game with fact and fiction, and uh, the reality should be somewhere in between those. And in uh, the last case study, I focus on uh, props from sci-fi movies. Uh, I got really interested in the role of these props in these movies because uh, we always have our uh, perspective from our present. And for me, it's really clear that these props that tell something about the future, future mainly refer to our present day. And there's sort of uh, yeah, sort of exchange between them. And I try to uh, distinguish these props from their original context. Uh, so I made uh, new 3D models uh, that refer to them, and I printed them and photographed them again to let them become 2, 2D again. And uh, these are some of the results. And that was my presentation. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Um, we'll have a couple questions, if there are any, and after that, we'll have a short break. Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, thank you for your presentation first, but uh, what I find interesting to see is that you, with your work, you try to find yourself a way of depicting um, the past or the future. Are you trying to do it more accurately than the people that went before us, no, or just your own vision? Not at all, just my own vision, and just another interpretation, and just okay. a way of uh, making people aware that these depictions aren't factual at all. Yeah. So it's, and I don't claim it's factual at all what I do, no. Okay, no. Yeah, yeah. So you can see this as fiction as well. Okay, yeah. all right, <laughs> thank you. Uh, it is up to me to introduce to you our third speaker. And um, his name is Thijs Witte, and he's a uh, PhD um, fellow at the Amsterdam School for Cultural Analysis at the Amsterdam uh, University. And um, his research is dedicated to the history and actuality of the essay form, so that is something we all can kind of relate to. And um, uh, what he's going to talk about is the um, uh, not an ology, like a collapsology, but an ism, and it's called circulatualism. And this is a concept by um, the uh, artist uh, Hito Style. Correct me if I uh, don't pronounce it right. And this is something um, from her. And uh, we had to uh, look at the um, uh, rhizomatic um, text, and uh, this is something that Thank God, uh, Hank Oosterling already explained to us because it was quite hard to understand. And um, we thought uh, there was a good connection between uh, Thijs Witte and um, uh, the uh, rhizomatic thinking. So um, I think I'll just spoil everything if I'm going to talk more. So I'll just like to introduce to you Thijs Witte. Thank you. So I've written it, so I will just read it for you. I timed it and it's 25 minutes long. In an essay titled In Freefall, commissioned by Eflux in 2011, the critic and filmmaker Hito Stayo asks us to imagine that we are falling. But, she adds, we also have to imagine that there is no ground below us. We are unlikely to register this fall as such because, as Stayo observes, if there is nothing to fall toward, we, are, uh, we may not even be aware that we are falling. It is this suspension, this disorientation, that characterizes our current predicament. For all we know, entire societies have plummeted in free fall, much like we have ourselves, but we neither truly feel nor know it, at least not adequately, because, as Tyle writes, these days we cannot assume any stable ground on which to base metaphysical claims or foundational political myths. At best, we are faced with temporary, contingent, and partial attempts at grounding. This groundlessness is, of course, not unique to the contemporary moment. 
the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation of 16th century Europe comes to mind, as does the birth of the atomic age and quantum uncertainty less than a century ago. The point is rather that we can only understand the repercussions and the reverberations of these immense transitions very fleetingly, and when we do, it is usually at a comfortable distance with the retrospective gaze of the historian. So how about uh, thinking through this suspension or this in free fall, this collapsology that I will invoke throughout my talk, when we are still falling? This is, I, I guess, the subject of my talk. It's also the subject or the main uh, reference um, that I think hinges the art of Hito style with the discussions that we've been having today. Part of the answer also lies in visuality. So if we can't intuit or truly feel this suspension, this free fall, it is in the new modes of perspectives that this free fall enables that we can find different ways of acting and different ways of um, thinking. I also chose to talk about Hito's style because there's something extremely helpful I find in her way of dealing with critical theory. Um, this has something to do with what I consider to be um, the embarrassment I experience whenever I'm talking about you know, grand systems, um, when I formulate critiques of the current um, modes of living. Um, there always seems to be this, this, this feeling that any uh, uh, concept doesn't really cover the complexity of contemporary life. But this, I would say, is exactly the starting point for Hito's style. Her basic point is, is that any conceptual schema, whether we call it Marxist, post-Marxist, autonomist, post-autonomist, it will be instantly humiliated by the immense complexity of contemporary modes of accumulation and mobility. It is this incomprehension, this black box, that is our shared condition. We can, however, learn what this means for us, that is, and not so much by looking through the black box, but looking at it. And by doing this, I would say, we can learn what it means for us all, and not just for those who have you know, become very well versed in, in critique, um, and make very sophisticated um, art or uh, design, or write very sophisticated books of cultural critique, although all those things are very important as well. I think the thing that we should be thinking about more is what do these huge, planetological, collapsological things entail for us, for you, me, what can we do? This kind of goes against the dominant logic of critique. Usually critique is celebrated, at least in the humanities, but also in the arts and culture industry more generally, as a cure for dogma or orthodoxy. But we think about it far less frequently in its own very mundane or straightforward uh, and cliched uh, ways of speaking and thinking. Like any other discourse, critique has you know, preferable turns of phrase, it has effective nuances, it has stylistic tricks um, and ticks. We usually invoke critique rather than examine it. Right? We use it to fend off enemies and to use it as a kind of like a protective shield uh, over our actions. Critique is usually synonymous with intellectual rigor. It is synonymous with theoretical sophistication. It is usually associated with a certain non-compliance with the status quo. I think, I mean, you feel free to disagree, but if you read and, and look at the work of Hito Stein, you see a certain tendency to go away from this authoritative use of critical theory or authoritative use of this tradition uh, into a, what I would call a very much a productive and transferential uh, model for artistic practice. Before I go into this, I will invoke uh, the second subject of my presentation, and that will be uh, one of the most perplexing and also one of the most uh, radical uh, responses from critical theory to the contemporary crisis, which is called accelerationism. So I guess for all the students who have been uh, doing the, the, the reading uh, group over the past few months, you're familiar with this term already. I will just explain it in a few sentences, what I think uh, it comes down to. So accelerationism names a tendency to turn vices into virtues. It's a tendency to, that imbues emancipatory currency in things that the tradition of critique usually considers to be impediments to emancipation. Very much like the futurists' obsession with propeller engines, accelerationism loves, uh, is in love with the frenetic speed that characterizes our political and aesthetic moment. It sees liberation in robotic automation. 
It considers unfettered capital flows as the privileged venture for counter-hegemonic political projects. It's, of course, a very compelling and very thrilling premise. It's a little bit like watching Star Wars and IMAX, uh, or Hunger Games, for that matter. But I don't think that this logic of collapse is in the least necessary, let alone logical. Accelerationism is a dystopia in disguise. It is slathered in misanthropy. It basically does not care much about the majority of the living beings on this planet. And if the main artistic reference is a Terminator movie, I think we have reason to worry. So the argument I will put forward instead, helped by Hito Style's work, is that accelerationism will only lead to more accelerationism. It will keep us in free fall, um, but that Hito Style gives us a very helpful counterexample of how to act whilst being in free fall, using the best what critique has to offer, but in productive, transferential terms. Now, you probably know Hito Style. She's prolific, she's prophetic, and I think it's with good reason that her work is widely commissioned, exhibited, discussed, and contested. We finally have a figure who takes our civilizational freefall as her starting point, who helps us think and work through this sense that a balance is disrupted, and she forges new concepts to help us navigate contemporary visual culture, both in terms of critical practice, that is, artistic research, and a new social contract which I will for now call a new socialism of the eye. I will come back to this at some later point. Now, what about this visuality? Um, Hito Style writes that as traditional modes of seeing and feeling are shattered, perspectives are twisted and multiply, and new types of visuality arise. So, but how did I get to this point where uh, Hito Style is mixed up with um, accelerationism? At an event called Accelerationism, a Symposium on Tendencies in Capitalism, held in Berlin in December 2013, Style presented a video essay, which was also called In Freeform. The video dealt with the kind of image recycling that characterizes contemporary visual culture. The observation that lies at the basis of the video is that networked capitalism not only has an appetite for easily digestible images, but that it also excretes them and leaves them in a trial of ruination. The video, therefore, not only displays the centrifugal movements of lo-fi and digital images, poor images, as she calls them, it also follows the material waste trails they leave behind, in this particular case, on an abandoned film set in the deserts of California. This is a later video. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it up there. Um, so the story of the film recounts the life of a Boeing 707 airplane. It was commissioned as a, uh, by a passenger airline company in the 1950s. Then it was sold to the Israeli Air Force in the 1970s, where it played a crucial role in a hostage res rescue mission after Palestinian militants hijacked a plane at Entebbe Airport in Uganda. After eventually winding up in the Mojave junkyard, the plane was given an afterlife when it was used as a prop and blown up for the 1995 Hollywood movie Speed. Its leftover parts were then sold to China, who used the aluminium of the plane to manufacture DVDs. At some point in the video, Style interviews her cameraman, who tells her that his livelihood had been eroded by the rise of digital media. DVDs have undercut the TV channels which provided him with work, and now even the DVD industry is being eaten away by online piracy. What's more, he also fell victim to the property downturn that led to the 2008 financial crash, which left him struggling to keep up with mortgage repayments. With In Freefall, the movie, um, Style shows us that even a symbol of global capitalism, as obviously physical as the airplane, can be subject to the same shifting of meaning as less tangible commodities, such as digital image files or media carriers. The question it raises is this, uh, are we trapped by pop cultural junk, much like passengers in a crashing aeroplane. As an off-camera voice asks just before the film ends, what happens to the passengers? Like its written counterpart, Style's video perfectly renders the coils of a politics and aesthetics of high acceleration. Her interest in the life of a commodity at various levels of circulation draws our attention to the frenetic speed by which cycles of production and reproduction take place, as well as to the violent dislocation of bodies and images. 
So I guess if you would need an example of an accelerationist aesthetic, this might very well be it, right? Um, but uh, upon closer examination, um, not so much. Um, because the installation at the Berlin Symposium was accompanied by a very small, almost inconspicuous critique written on the display tag. Uh, and I will quote from this display tag. The author, uh, Hito Steyl, wishes to personally insult anyone attracted by accelerationism by calling it dead, white, Ferrari envy, dripping from head to toe with stale testosterone. This debunking of accelerationism is all too timely, I would think, especially now that the, its ideas are rapidly gaining ground in um, more and more circles, uh, including art and design. It also, of course, a bit paradoxically perhaps, shows how and to what extent she herself is implicated or even invested in the accelerationist provocation. This provocation of accelerationism follows, I think, you know, from a rather clever observation about the nature of time in industrial modernity, in the, uh, the, the form of capitalism that we kind of know or are familiar with. The nature of time in capitalism is basically a regime of temporality. It is a way of organizing the relation between movement and time. With the liberation of capital, modern day capitalism, comes a frenetic productivity and mobility of variable and ever expanding units of value. The violence of this uprooting is unprecedented in world history. But the accelerationist uh, provocation claims that it's also inexorable or even more radically, that we haven't gone quite far enough. So on the one hand, you have a capitalism that dismantles every existing social and cultural structure and norm, while on the other hand, reviving any number of primitive formations, like scarcity, fetishism, tribalism, despotism, and in the final instance, also fascism. If capitalism is defined as the tension between the deterritorialization and re-territorialization of capital, then it follows that one way, or perhaps the only way, so the logic goes, uh, of surpassing capitalism would be to remove all the re-territorializing forces. And this is kind of where accelerationism takes its entire premise from a single quote by Deleuze and Guattari that you've also read. Um, I can show it. Makes it a, a bit easier. Um, so this is taken from uh, Anti-Oedipus. So what is the solution? Which is the revolutionary path? Is there one? To withdraw from the world market, or might it be to go in the opposite direction? To go still further, that is, in the movement of the market of decoding and deterritorialization. For perhaps the flows are not yet deterritorialized enough, not decoded enough from the viewpoint of a theory and a practice of a highly schizophrenic character. Not to withdraw from the process, but to go further, to accelerate the process. In this matter, the truth is that we haven't seen anything yet. The most recent formulation of the accelerationist hypothesis interprets this, what I would say is a rather ambivalent passage in a very literal way. In the Accelerationist Manifesto, the British academics Nick Snorichek and Alex Williams claim that the only adequate response to ongoing capitalist disintegration is the exacerbation, so the increase of its uprooting tendencies. And while arguing this, they accost pretty much everything uh, of leftist movements and institutions for their apparent inability to provide a substantial alternative to the ruling mechanisms of power. What is my concern in a nutshell? That this kind of speculative engagement, um, it, it simply bypasses any material division that capitalist abstractions um, uh, impose. So, and, and the moment you kind of forget these material divisions or when you sidestep them, you will soon forget that these abstractions also thrive and therefore depend on the maintenance of these divisions. So here comes Hito Style. For well over two decades, Stiles' work has dealt with the meshing of subjectivity and technology, two concerns that bleed into an aesthetics of capitalist production and exchange. In both her written and audiovisual essays, she traces capitalism's transformations into the so-called information economy, which can be roughly situated in historical terms from around the 1950s onwards. 
the main claim that she makes, and this is in, you know, uh, in keeping with a certain theoretical trajectory of post-Marxism, that the production of subjectivity rather than the production of commodities has become central to both va uh, value accumulation and extraction. To put this more simply, it means that we should be looking at the movements of capital as much in the intimate spaces of private lives um, as in the more spatialized, grandiose imaginaries of productivist political theory to which accelerationism still belongs, I would say. So besides this focus on a disastrous large-scale consequences of this modern-day capitalism, Steyl therefore also analyzes all kinds of mediations of intimate living labor in both art and social movements. And she shows us how the information economy now organizes the relationship between emotions, desires, and time, capturing the empty core of living labor in its own image. This situation, she says, can only be surpassed by producing subjectivities against the encroaching submission to all of these perverted capitalist virtues and value. And this brings her very close to um, what I hope is your main investment, artistic research. It comes to get, it, it sort of comes down to a request or a, a need to um, map, map the current predicament that we live in, to give new perspective uh, to the experience of free fall that is our shared condition. Now this engagement of artistic research that is no longer so much invested in you know, the grandiose productivist idea of capital accumulation, pits her against a rather impressive list of accelerationist thinkers. Marx, for instance, the, the patron saint of capitalist critique, anti-capitalist critique, um, considered capitalism to be a necessary stage out of feudalism. And he also thought that capitalism was a logical precursor to a far more sophisticated communism. Accelerationism, for Marx, signaled nothing more than the need for a subjective intervention in the ruling modes of production and exchange. What we needed, according to Marx, and this is pretty much paraphrased from the Communist Manifesto, is a proletariat that embraces all the technological um, uh, uh, and liberating forces that capitalism had to offer. Deleuze and Guattari's anti-Oedipus similarly defines capitalism by this tendency to always decode and deterritorialize, to always uproot at the same time as it recodes and re-territorializes. I would say, though, that 43 years after the publication of Deleuze and Guattari's Anti-Oedipus, and more than 150 years since Marx and Engels' The Communist Manifesto, a revisitization of the politics and aesthetics of acceleration stand little risk of appearing untimely. Today, the globe, the world, the planet, whatever you want to call this thing that is in free fall, is undergoing forms of development and disintegration at a speed that neither the thinkers of the rootstock nor the dreamers of labor power could ever have imagined. It is a speed that has ceased to exist on a humanly comprehensible scale. However, the importance of rethinking acceleration is not so much a matter of degrees. I would say it is much more um, a question of an increasingly ambiguous relationship to politics. And just to clarify what I mean by this is that it doesn't really make much sense to claim that you, uh, that you propagate an accelerationist aesthetics or politics because by definition we are all accelerationists today. Right? If we want to pay our mortgage, we have to work harder. If we want to get to work on time, we have to get fancier cars. So there is somehow this already this, this, this common condition that I would call, yeah, pretty much accelerated life, is very difficult to sort of fit in um, a, a critical practice or a critical understanding of the contemporary uh, predicament. So in her many commentaries on the digital image in times of high abstraction, Steyl suggests an alternative to this accelerationist obsession with speed. She calls this circulationism, and it's a concept forged in the spirit of arithmetics of time and action beyond the restrictions imposed by the concepts of speed or deterritorialization. Steyl asks us to imagine another form of value that is divined by intensity and spread rather than velocity alone. As poor images, so the images I just showed you, she uses the concept of the poor images to the poor image to describe the nature of this, this kind of digital um, uh, image. Um, it is poor because it is compressed, and it travels quickly because it has led very little matter. You could even say that poor images, the more matter they lose, the more speed they gain. So poor images, the dominant, the billions of 
low-fi digital images that circulate the globe, they express a condition of dematerialization. And this dematerialization, it shares not only with um, you know, the legacy of conceptual art, for instance, but also with the contemporary modes of semiotic production. The circulation of poor images creates a circuit which fulfills the original ambition of uh, experimental cinema, for instance. It creates what I would call an alternative economy of images. It creates what I would also call an imperfect cinema, which exists inside as well as beyond commercial media streams. In the age of file sharing, even marginalized content circulates again and it reconnects the otherwise dispersed worldwide audiences. It is a circulation of poor images that creates um, what Ziga Vertov once called a visual bond. And this is the socialism of the eye I invoked at the beginning. A visual bond was, according to Vertov, supposed to link the workers of the world with each other. So he Im imagined this as a sort of communist visual uh, language, uh, a visual grammar that could not only inform or entertain the masses, but also organize them. So in a sense, what I think Style is suggesting is that with circulationism as our shared condition of image circulation, this dream of a visual bond has come true, if only under the rule of a currently dominant uh, information capitalism, whose audiences are linked almost in a physical way by mutual excitement, effective attunement, and anxiety. Style argues that what the Soviet avant-garde of the 20th century called productivism, the claim that art should enter production and the factory can now be replaced by circulationism. Circulationism, she writes, is not so much about the art of making an image, but the art of post-producing, launching, and accelerating it. Taking at face value, circulationism therefore merely only captures the specific mode of disembodied circulation that is dominant in today's digital capitalism. But if we reinvent it, Circulationism can also become about short-circuiting already existing networks. It could become what Style calls the art of recoding or rewiring the system by exposing state scopophilia, capital compliance, and wholesale surveillance. I mean, of course, it can go as wrong as its predecessor um, by, for instance, aligning itself once again with a cult of productivity or heroic exhaustion. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I don't think there's any reason to be pessimistic about these suggestions that Style is making. I will try to clarify a bit. By talking about another video essay that she made. Um, this is a 2007 video essay called Lovely Andrea. The video essay depicts two women who try to track down a bondage photograph that was taken of one of them in the 1980s in Japan. Locating this picture requires the women to undertake a journey through Japan's bondage industry. One of the protagonists is in fact Hito Style herself, accompanied by Asagi Agia, the artist's translator, and herself also a bondage model. The missing image, incidentally, is of Style herself, it is a portrait of the artist as a young woman, bound up in elaborate and sexualized knots. In one sense, Lovely Andrea is a document of the plausible choice available to young women in times of acceleration, something that is central to the formation of their own subjectivity in a culture of poor images. It's the choice of being rather than having it all, by becoming, that is, both worker and commodity. But I would say in yet another sense, Lovely Andrea becomes the aesthetic form. Right, okay. um, Lovely Andrea becomes the aesthetic form that circulationism implies, because all of its archival material was downloaded through peer-to-peer uh, -peer network uh, sharing uh, uh, networks. P2P networks are essentially um, a way of connecting individual computers to each other in order to facilitate file sharing. And they represent a rather recent and unofficial image circuit, which nevertheless circulates huge amounts of audiovisual material free of charge, and it offers access to a lot of rare material, uh, like the experimental essay films, uh, including those of styles. I mean, I took all of these images from uh, like illegal downloads on uh, Kara Gargan. Um, so I guess this leads once again into uh, an interesting venue for circulationism. 20 or 30 years ago, as Style observes, 
a neoliberal restructuring of media production began to slowly obscure any non-commercial imagery to the point where experimental and essayistic cinema became almost invisible. As it became extremely expensive to keep these works circulating in cinemas, so they were thought also to be too marginal to broadcast on television. And thus, they slowly started to disappear not only from cinemas, but from the public sphere altogether. Experimental films, video essays, remained for the most part unseen, except for some occasional screenings in film museums or film clubs projected in their original resolution before disappearing again into the darkness of the archive. But, as Steyl, uh, you know, I think, very entertainingly observed, today there are at least 20 torrent files of all the Chris Marker films. So if you want to have your retrospective, you can have it. You know, it requires very little investment. <laughs> but the economy of poor images is, more about, uh, is about more than just downloads. Because we can also keep the files once we've downloaded them. We can re-watch them, we can re-edit them, we can improve them if we want to or when we consider it necessary. And then the results can be circulated with relative ease and consumed by thousands the world over. But what Steyl also makes clear is that if, uh, if, if circulationism wants to mean anything to our present uh, condition of free fall, if it wants to intervene as a visual bond in the age of collapse, then it has to go into the world of offline distribution as well. It must, in other words, enable a 3D de dissemination of resources, of affects, of places, of inspiration. Indeed, as Steyl asks, if images can be shared and circulated, why can't everything else be too? If data moves across screens, so can its material incarnation move across shop windows or other enclosures. If copyright can be dodged and called into question, why can't private property as well? Why only claim open access to GStore and not to MIT, the university, as a whole? In circulationism, images exist to be performed, that is, to be repeated and remade in some manner, and post-producing images uh, means that one constantly performs and reperforms the digital source material. So why not do this by taking the audience through whatever images one can scavenge or footage that one can shoot cheaply? Basically, and I will conclude with this, is that I think rather than being accelerationists, we should embrace the fact that we are all circulationists today. And I would conclude by saying that Steyl's work begins to address the consequences of such a state of play. That's it. Thanks. Any questions in the audience? I think it's very interesting because we are producers as artists and art academy students, how far we are visually literate and do we think about this post-productive process of our work? So that was very inspiring and maybe triggering for us to think about what happens to our work and how we develop it further. Questions? <laughs> Uh, thank you. This was an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, uh, I'm really curious uh, about this uh, circulationist um, mechanism. Of course, it's part of the condition we're all in as makers or educators. One of the problems that I encounter, though, is that the network itself is invisible. You only see the the spewing of images on a on, and the content and downloading, you don't actually see how things are connected as such. I was wondering if um, this particular characteristic of the invisibility of the, the chains of production and, and, and circulation is involved in maybe or certain problems, um, sort of in the aesthetic limitations of what we're dealing with in order to critique it effectively. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what I would say is that, that style doesn't propose as much a critique as a critical practice. So um, she's very much aware of the censorship involved with you know, uh, official networks of circulation. I think what she's trying to emphasize is that we are forgetting that there are billions of worthwhile visual forms of communication that circulate 
more or less unfettered, of course, below the streams of dominant uh, media circulation. Um, and this is, again, a, 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 you know, a hopefully not an endless play between uh, re-territorializing tendencies of capitalism and deterritorializing tendencies of, you know, uh, a communist desire for a free circulation. But does deterritorializing in this sense lead to, what, what does that lead to? Let's say I'm open. Um, the visual bond, so a visual grammar that helps us navigate and understand um, conditions that are not purely aesthetic, but could also be uh, political. I but deterritorialization could also lead to a lack of a bond, couldn't it? Or am I misunderstanding the, what you mean? I mean, yeah, sure. But again, I think what, what, what Stey was driving home very much with um, making both uh, films whose subject matter is about deterritorializing, re-territorializing tendencies, as well as the way of making them, that there is something that we can always do, no matter we are, you know, sophisticated, fancy, highly educated white men in universities or disenfranchised uh, people that have access to, uh, have limited access to uh, the internet. So I think what she's emphasizing is that circulationism today, it's, it's defined by incompleteness or um, uh, incomprehension, because it's only the beginning of an age that is only coming into existence as we speak. So she, she talks about this in terms of uh, communication without a code. So we know that something is going on, but we, um, we signify it differently. And I think this, this state of confusion characterizes the current uh, uh, situation of circulationism. I know it's a problem that I really should ask this question to Hito, and it's maybe I can also put in the anecdote. There's a uh, there's a circumstance that I'm co-writing a book with her, so <laughs> I have to use you as a proxy. But don't you think that that um, we're that there is no real uh, difference between circulationism and accelerationism, and that circulationism is not really, let's say, a critical correction of of uh, capitalist acceleration, because if you look and how the media and IT industries work today. They have no problem with you sharing stuff on, on BitTorrent because that just means that there will be more data ser uh, ser uh, centers, that uh, uh, you need to buy new uh, computers. The whole model of the creative industries has shifted from content production to infrastructure uh, since a long time. It has, has shifted from Hollywood uh, uh, to Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley is happy if, 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 you, if you circulate. You know, this is not disrupting uh, capitalism at all. And this has been the fallacy of the whole open source movement, you know, um, which is completely co-opted. If, if you look, for example, at, at open source uh, production, how Linux is being developed, it's all corporate. Um, and it's also how, how Wikipedia uh, works uh, in the meantime, etc., etc. So um, I, I think there's a problem that we're still thinking in the old models of image production like in, in the terms like, uh, like the in creative industries used to work in the 1980s and the 1990s, where the internet was indeed a disruption to copyright, to authorship, to classical notions of, of let's say, information capital. But you know, the times are over. This is, this, the, 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 the industry is no longer concerned with these old mo uh, modes of uh, authorships and is happy that, that the system has switched. And circulationism is absolutely mainstream. Facebook, Google, they are happy if, you, if you're a circulationist. Sure. Um, but once it, I, I would say that this is a rather paranoid reading of the way that capitalism works. It's also reductive. I don't think that she would disagree. Uh, I'm not speaking in anyone's uh, um, uh, place, by the way. This is what I think. That um, it is exactly those kinds of critiques of the way that capitalism works today that limits our understanding to act properly. It is, I think very reductive to claim that um, capitalism doesn't care about free circulation of images. They very much do. There are, you know, why did Aaron Sorkin kill himself, you know? Like, there are very obvious ways that capitalism still desires a fixed re-territorialization and privatization of what we would call the commons. So I think we have increasing amounts of commons within capitalism. I also think that it is very uh, ill-advised to consider that there are places outside of capitalism. I think we're in it. We make it and we reproduce it. It's becoming, you know, this 
a Hydra monster that is somehow beyond our control. All of this is very much true, but you should look at the way that images facilitate and give agency to the otherwise disenfranchised or the otherwise invisible. I mean, I was only focusing on a very few narrow examples, but if you look at the way that indigenous and third world cinema now circulates in ways that was previously pretty much impossible except for elite white audiences, you can't claim that this is you know, something that capitalism celebrates. I mean, that is your reading of the way that capitalism works and not necessarily the way that people gain agency, grow power and become visible and are able to communicate with each other in ways that are not capitalist. There's, not, there's only one economy, I give you that, but there are always plural, multiple ways of acting within that economy. I just don't think that the circulation makes a qualitative difference. You know? There have always been ways of subversion, but circulation is not a qualitative uh, a difference to, to, to allowing subversion. It's just another, uh, it's just another uh, mode of economics and that can be mainstream capitalist or not. Well, what, what would be economic about doing an underground uh, retrospective of um, uh, um, indigenous cinema? What will be um, uh, capitalist about um, taking Hollywood films and making mashups to give a political to provide political satire? You know, what is capitalist about screening films on national television by hijacking certain media uh, circuits? You know, when I'm saying like there's always more than just, you know, a narrow form of subversion that we can identify and we can include in the, you know, in the, the categories that critical theory gives us, or we can use those concepts and those terms to navigate through the current predicament. Because there is no shared language, we have to make it. And I think this is what circulationism enables and something like accelerationism debilitates. So, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Can I uh, uh, ask something about the uh, the notion because you suggest that uh, accelerationism is different from circula cir circularism right mm -hmm. to get used to the term Circula uh, circulationism mm -hmm. right so but first of all in virtual time in, in virtual uh, in the virtual sphere in the info sphere there's no time right okay so it has to land somewhere to materialize, being re-territorialized, for instance. So is circulationism, on the level of the virtual, exact, not exactly the same as accelerationism? Because it just goes anywhere. It just connects, like this. And once it is taken in, taken down, it suddenly gives the opportunity, as you said, to create agency, subjectivity. Okay. So, the suggestion of circulationism is the circle. So where does the circle close? If there isn't the closure of the circle, for instance, by taking in the images, uh, appropriating them, and putting them into the system as a kind of critique, if the circle isn't closed, if there isn't a feedback loop, then circulationism is exactly the same uh, as, uh, accelerationism. Okay, you agree with me? I would say let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. I don't think no, no, there's, I throw, there's any I'll way I'll of throw knowing. Nothing. It's just I want to just get sure about exactly the argument that you gave to uh, the well, guy that cr I mean, criticized it because it is this moment that it is re-territorialized into real life, people taking it in and in a way using it in a material sense mm -hmm. to create agency. So that's the closing of the loop. As long as it is in the virtual world, it's the same as just accelerating and just connecting uh, to all directions. Mm. So the moment uh, of getting it into the material world and making it into a tool to critique or to create agency, that's the closing moment of this circulationism, I think. Or just a landing, you know? Well, um, okay, but then the free fall is gone. So you land, you need to land. But so that's, that's exactly the kind of like right. the, the temporary okay. and contingent ways of grounding that I think we kind of need. 
Okay. You know, okay. Um, I just want to I, elaborate on the idea yeah. of. I mean, I think it's important to say that accelerationism, I mean, there I strictly refer to the way that it's been conceived of recently with this manifesto and this, this book reader. Um, it's also not to say that I'm completely, you know, dismissive. I think ultimately it's a politics that doesn't really give much of a shit about actual problems. Mm -hmm. It is elitist, it is a form of uh, totalitarianism, it is, you know, it's like you said, it is, it's grounded in a politics that, you know, it's easy to confuse it with Stalinism. So I think there's nothing much to gain there, but it's a good grammar for understanding the freefall. You know, it's a good acknowledgement of, yes, indeed, we are living in times of high acceleration. But to take that into and turn it into a political program is, I think, wildly misguided. And that's why I think more creative appropriations of that condition, like circulationism, okay, right. it's just one example, yeah. but they're more productive. Okay. Yeah. I feel like it's time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.